I tell you, this, this, uh, this journey into grace, this Word of Grace conference, and this journey into grace just keeps getting better and better, yes, doesn't it? Does. You don't ever reach the finish line. You don't ever reach the pinnacle. Every time you think you've reached the ultimate pinnacle, you look on the horizon and there's another pinnacle looming before you to explore and know. Little did I know in 1990 when God put me on my face in the middle of the night crying like a baby and telling him I wanted out of ministry and that the Christian life was overrated in the office of my church where I served as pastor. There's a lot goes on behind the scenes with pastors that you don't know about. I often say I don't have to lie about those things anymore because I'm not a pastor anymore. So I can tell the truth about them now. Uh, and uh, that night I thought, this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, in fact, I said to God, this, this Christian life is overrated. It's great for getting me into heaven, but in the meantime, what's the big deal? And I said, this is ministry I want out. And little did I know, that was October 6, 1990. I wrote about it in my first book, Grace Walk, 20 years ago. When that book was released, I told that story. But little did I know that what a journey this would be and, and, and a journey that continues God first began to teach me the truth of who I am in Jesus Christ. And that is a message I will forever share with people because it amazes me, folks that don't understand the kinder grace content, the very basic fundamental things of our faith, our co-crucifixion with Jesus Christ, the death of the Adamic nature and, 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 and the adoption of humanity in Christ and, and uh, all of these things. It's amazing the basic things that we don't get sometimes. I was trapped in legalism for a long time and I want to talk just a little bit about that this morning. This is not, uh, you know, you never know when you talk to a group. For some, some folks this will be something you may be well familiar with and you could perhaps teach it and, and share it as, as well as I do. For others, it might be something that will tweak your understanding, and for others, it might be something that you don't know at all, but I, all I know is legalism is a cancer in the body of Christ. Yes, it it's destroying the intimate walk with God that He intends for us to know and experience. Legalism is the, is, is, is the divider of, of, of mankind, whereas grace is the uniter. Legalism separates us. Grace brings us together. Maybe I shared with you, I love, this, I love telling this. I don't know if I've told it here or not. You know, you speak in so many places and you're, you really don't remember what you said where, but I think the best illustration of legalism that I heard was the, the, the incident where the guy said that he was uh, driving one day and he came to a bridge where a guy was standing on the edge about to jump off the bridge and he stopped his car and he jumped out and he ran over to him. He said, stop, don't jump. And the guy said, why shouldn't I jump? He said, well, there's so much for you to live for. And he said, like what? He said, well, he said, are you religious or atheist? He said, I'm religious. He said, well, I am too. He said, are you a Christian or a Buddhist? And the guy said, a Christian. He said, me too. He said, are you Catholic or Protestant? And the guy said, Protestant. He said, well, me too. He said, are you a, a Episcopalian or Baptist? He said, Baptist. He said, oh, me too. He said, are you, are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? He said, Baptist Church of the Lord. He said, me too. He said, are, are, you, are you original Baptist Church of the Lord or are you Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord? He said, I'm Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord. He said, whoa, me too. He said, are you Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord Reformation of 1879 or the Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord Reformation of 1915? He said, I'm, I'm, I'm Baptist Church of the Lord Reformation of 1915. And I said, die, you heretic scum. And I pushed him off the bridge. Sadly, that's more true than we want to uh, recognize, isn't it? But that's what legalism does. Legalism is a system of living in which we try to make spiritual progress or gain God's blessings based on what we do. Let me say it again. Legalism is a system of living in which we try to make spiritual progress or gain God's blessings based on what we do. Grace stands in sharp contrast to legalism because grace, as I'll define it for the purpose of this teaching, grace is the system of living in which God blesses us 
because we're in Jesus Christ and for no other reason at all. Amen. He just blesses us because we've been adopted in Christ. We've been swept up in His embrace and God doesn't bless us because of how good we are or aren't. God blesses us because of how good He is. Yes. I want to read a text of Scripture to you that you are familiar with and I'm not going to get into the historicity of the text or anything like that, the mythology. I'm not getting at all of that. I'm just going to speak about this text the way the Apostle Paul did and others through the ages as we look together at the narrative about the fall in the Garden of Eden. You know the text in Genesis 3 and verse 1, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees of the gar in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made a covering for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Genesis chapter 3, the story of the fall here in the garden, is a beautiful metaphor that for, what, for the, the, the very topic that I'm talking about today, legalism, and how we fall into legalism and the effect that it has on us. God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and... In this story, we see God instructing them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was in the middle of the garden, but they could eat from all the other trees. Genesis tells us that there were two trees in specific, specific trees that were mentioned there, the tree of life. If you want to take the, uh, the, 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 the metaphor and run it on out, you know, the tree of life could very easily represent Jesus Christ, uh, life. Uh, you read the New Testament, even a cursory understanding of the New Testament will soon show you that when we talk about life, we're talking about Jesus. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the one I want to focus on this morning because this is the tree that God said don't eat from at all. Now, let me go ahead and tell you that when we talk about legalism, the system of living by which we try to make spiritual progress or gain God's blessings based on what we do, legalism is a system of moralism. Moralism is a cheap substitute for the life to which we've actually been called. Yep. Moralism is to a, a, a lifestyle that flows from our union with God. Moralism to that lifestyle is what a prostitute is to a long and enduring marriage. There might be some similarities that you could make comparison with, but they're far, far different from one another. And so God put them in the garden, and according to the narrative, He said to them, uh, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, because in the day that you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And so the serpent comes along and when he comes to Eve, uh, he says, so God has said that you can't eat from any of these trees? And God said, and, and Eve said, no, God said we could eat from all of the trees except this one tree. We can't eat from that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice that this was a tree of knowledge. It was a tree that provided knowledge to, to, to mankind that we, we didn't have and wouldn't have otherwise. The tree of the knowledge, it's a tree that when they ate from it, they gained knowledge. What would they gain knowledge of? Of good and evil. So before they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, did they possess the knowledge of good and evil? No. The answer is no. But that might sound strange to us in the 21st, religious, 21st century religious world in which we live, but the reality is they didn't need to know good from evil, and, and, and we don't either. Because the intent of God for them was not that they would live a lifestyle based on good and evil. Good and evil are the parameters that define and delineate the meaning of morality. And God's intention for them was not that they should live a lifestyle of morality based on right and wrong, good and evil. They had cap capability of much more than a, mirac than a moral lifestyle. They had the ability to live a miraculous lifestyle. You and I live in union with the Father through the Son in the Spirit. 
And when we move to the place in our walk where we make it become about moral living, we have missed the intent and the ultimate desire that our loving Father has for us because He does not purpose for us to live a life of morality. He intends for us to live a miraculous lifestyle that flows out of union. There were two branches on that tree. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you would listen to the preaching and teaching of the 21st century church, and you were to come back to that story and rewrite it based on what we hear in church today, what you would have is God telling Adam and Eve, there's a tree here, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you approach that tree, the way we would say it today, if we, went, if we were consistent with the preaching that exists today, we would say, when you approach that tree, Adam and Eve, be sure that you only eat from the good branch. Don't ever eat from the evil branch, only eat from the good branch. In fact, you eat all the fruit off that good branch you can eat because you need to know what good is so that you can do right. So you eat that so you'll grow and be nurtured in that which is good. That's what we would have said. Eat from the good branch, but don't eat from the evil branch. But that's not what God said. God said to them, you don't eat from that tree, period. That is not a tree that concerns you. That is not a tree that you are to be related to in any way because my intent is not that you should be tied to moral behavior. My intent that is, is that you should live in union with me. With me. Now, in the modern church, we're all about sin management. So the message of the modern church to those who come to church every week is get out of the evil branch and crawl over into the good branch. Stop living on the evil branch and start living on the good branch. But it misses the mark altogether. It misses the point altogether. Let's imagine for a minute Adam had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go with the flow on this. You see what I'm doing. I'm speaking of this as a metaphor. Go Adam had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and so now his eyes are open. He knows good from evil, and he's, uh, you know, now he, everything's changed for him. And so one morning he's asleep, he's resting, and Eve comes in, and uh, she comes over, and she gently nudges him, and he opens his eyes, and she's got a, a basket of fruit that she's picked for him. And she says, sweetheart, she said, I, you, she said, you seem to have a good night's rest, and I just wanted to start your day right by serving you breakfast in bed. Here, here, honey, would you like some fruit? And let's imagine Adam now. He, remember, he's eating from the tree. The fall has happened. So he's eating from that tree. So he opens his eyes and sees what she's doing. He says, woman, what are you doing waking me up? I tossed and turned. Those animals kept me awake most of the night. And I finally dozed off to sleep. And here I am finally getting some rest. And you come in here waking me up and shoving that. Wait a minute. I, don't, I know you're not serving, shoving fruit in my face. Don't even tell me that's fruit you're trying to get me to eat again. Hadn't you caused enough trouble, you stupid idiot? Get out. He slaps a basket of fruit out of her hand. She, get out of here. You, this is the kind of stuff. You drive me crazy. He, she runs off into the bushes. <laughs> now, here's a question. It's not a trick question. Did what Adam do right then, what he did, was it good or evil? That's evil. We, unless you say right and wrong, good, evil, synonymous. It was wrong, wasn't it? It was evil. So let's think about it. Later on in the day, Adam starts feeling guilty about what he's done. And he thinks, oh man, that was so wrong. That was evil. That was just evil. So he comes to Eve and he says, honey, I need to talk to you. He said, I am so sorry. I have really messed up. The way I treated you is just inexcusable. I, that's just horrible that I would treat you that way, that I would speak to you that way. What kind of man am I? Stupid, stupid, stupid. I wouldn't blame you if you let me for another. Well, anyway, you get the general point, Eve. I'm making it. Eve, I, this is horrible what I did, but yeah, honey, would you forgive me? Please forgive me. I tell you, I'm going to make it up to you. Tomorrow? No, starting right now. Starting right now it, and all day tomorrow, it's going to be Eve day on planet Earth. I'm going to make it up to you, baby. It's going to be Eve day, and I'm going to treat you good. 
I'm going to treat you good. You watch what I tell you. You sit down over there now, sweetheart. I'll tend to the animals. I'll do the rest of this. And so for the rest of the day, he treats her so good. That night, he just tells her how much he loves her. And he says, you lie down. And, he, and then he gives her a back massage with no ulterior motives. And then he, and then he <laughs> kisses her on the cheek. And he says, he says, oh, honey, you're just so wonderful. And she says, oh, Adam, she says, you're so good to me. Now, that day, at that time, the, the, did he do good or evil? He did good. That's good. That, that's good. But now, listen. The first time when he slapped the bowl of fruit out of her hand, was, 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 he, was, he, you know, was God pleased with that approach? Was that the way that, that God intended that life should be? No. The son, then, but, but when he got his mind right and then he treated her good, was that the way that God had purposed that his life should be? No. No. One time he did evil, the other time he did good, but listen, in both cases, he was still up the wrong tree. He was still living out of the wrong tree. That is not the tree to which we have been called. We have, we have not been called to a performance and to clean up our performance. We have been called to the person of Jesus Christ. And I guess I could say it like this. God doesn't want us to change limbs. God wants us to know that in Jesus Christ we've changed trees. Amen. That's right. And we now live in union with him. So, so the serpent says, you can't eat from any of the trees, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said we can, uh, Eve said we can eat from all of them except that tree because if we eat from that tree, we're going to die. And, and, and the serpent said, you will not die. God knows that when you eat from that tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, let's, let's, let's think about what he said there for a minute. God knows that when you eat from that tree, you'll be like him, knowing good from evil. So she begins to get it in her mind that there's a gap between where she is and where she can be, right? There's a gap. Here's where I am, but if I were to do that, here's where I could be. I could be more like God. So she, she, there's introduced into her mind this, this uh, bogus sense of deficiency that in reality does not exist. Because when God made Adam and Eve, the scripture says, he looked at them and said, it's good. It's good. In fact, you have the, in the account, God saying, let us make man in our own image. And so there was no deficiency there. There was no shortcoming. But I'm going to speak in, you know, this kind of terminology to say that today, and to, don't, don't, don't parse my words and overanalyze what I'm saying. Go with the flow of the narrative I'm given. Today, I'm going to say, the serpent might say to you, there's something wrong with you. You're not all you could be. There's a gap between who you are and who you ought to be. And that's how it begins. There's the, there's the steps, the first step toward legalism. It's this sense that somehow there's something inherently wrong with me. There's something not right. There's something I lack. There's something I need. And if I'll just do this thing, then I'll achieve that. And I'll, I'll close the gap and I'll become more like God. There's something I need. Let me tell you straight up, straight out, and straight on. There's nothing wrong with you. Ephesians 4.24 says, you are, God, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It's the word poema. You are a divine work of art. There's nothing wrong with you. Don't believe any lie that comes to you that causes you to feel deficient. Just listen, there might be something wrong on you. You know what I mean? We can get dirt on us, but that doesn't define us. That doesn't define us. I do a weekly teaching every week on the internet and on my website. You know, check it out, gracewalk.org. I put a teaching up there every week. And I just did one this last week about how that I'm going through, uh, uh, what's the book about Nehemiah? My mind blank. He brought them back to, this, to Jerusalem and now they were going to read number, recount, they were going to do the genealogy of the people. And I was making the point, the people when they'd been in Babylonian captivity had forgot their authentic identity and, and they needed to know their identity so they could go forward in wholeness. That's all you need. God doesn't need to change you. God just needs to show us who we already are. That's right. 
And so Eve felt this sense of deficit. And listen, listen to the lie that the serpent said to her. The, the lie said, the, the, the serpent said, he said, Eve, if you'll just do this one thing, you'll be more godly. If you'll eat from this fruit, you'll be more godly. You'll be more like God if you do this. If you'll just eat from this tree, you'll be more godly. One thing, do this and you'll be more like God. So now listen, hear this out. This might be new to you, maybe not, but listen, it was to me when I saw it. Eve said to herself, so let me understand what he's saying is if I do this thing, I'll become more like God? Well, who wouldn't want to do that thing? Because certainly I want to become more like God. And so she took the fruit and she ate it for the purpose of becoming more like God. Now, notice, in this story, the, the step that Eve took when she ate the fruit against God's clear instruction not to, Eve was not trying to do a bad thing. She was trying to do a good thing. This is not somebody who gave God the finger and said, I'll eat what I want to eat. This is somebody who said, if I do this, I'll be more like God. Why? Because the serpent had introduced into her mind this sense of deficiency that in reality did not exist. But once she fell for that sense of deficiency and shortcoming, then had, once he had her in that far, he said, now, now that you know you're, there's a deficit in you, I'm going to tell you what you can do that will make you more like God. Here's this one thing. You do it, you'll be more godly. And she did it. Did the serpent tell her the truth or a lie? A lie. But now here's the, here's the sad irony of it. It would be comical if it weren't so pathetic. The serpent gave her one thing to do, but the modern church pulpits give us 10,000 things to do to move or like God. I mean, we're the, if I can say it this way, and again, go with the flow of my, the narrative I'm giving here. Um, the devil was more merciful than most pastors, <laughs> including me when I was a legalistic preacher. You know, the serpent said, do this one thing and you'll be more like God. I gave my church a thousand things to do to be more like God. But you see, the problem with that is when you take that legalistic route and you're trying to achieve righteousness that you actually already possess, when you try to achieve it, you're trying to scratch somewhere that you can't find, quite figure out the itch. You're never going to accomplish it because we don't achieve righteousness. We have received righteousness as a gift. And so, but when you, when, you, when you eat from that tree, when you go down that direction like Eve did, it's like trying to quench your thirst with salt water. It'll never quench your thirst. Yeah, I don't care how sincere you are. Listen, I tried hard. I've told my story enough, and even in this church. Some of you know my story. I was a de devoted Southern Baptist evangelical zealot who was out knocking on doors and praying day and night and fasting and doing this and reading my Bible and doing that. I mean, I was on fire with it. I won't say that I did it well, but my oldest son, who's now 40, when he could barely write and draw, the first picture he drew was a big old poster of me behind the pulpit, and under it he wrote, when I grow up, I want to be a fireball preacher like my daddy. <sighs> I was a zealot. I was sincere, but I never had peace. I wanted to achieve righteousness but I never could and I never can because it's not achieved, it's received. doesn't matter how sincere you are, how hard you go at it. Listen, I'll give you an example. I have a horrible sense of direction. I mean a horrible sense of direction. It is bizarre. It's embarrassing. Grown men should be turned loose. Thank God for Siri. That is the greatest gift of God. Oh my goodness. I just say, Siri, tell me where, how do I get to here? And she'll say, go down here, go there. One thing I did when I first, I had to get used to her. I had to get used to her. Because when I first got Siri and I passed my, she'd say, turn around and make a U-turn. And I thought, you know what? She sounds like she's nagging me. <laughs> and I found out there was a man's voice on there and I switched it to the man's voice and he sounded so smart. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Wendy, you're not having a spell back there, are you? Okay. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> But Siri will say, do this, do this, do that. I have a horrible sense of direction. I need that. Before I got Siri and she began to tell me where to go, I was going to a certain church to speak. And this guy, I, I, I was driving. And the guy said, you go down here to that intersection and you go east. I thought, go east? I don't speak compass. Go up, go down. 
go left, go right. Don't speak compass to me. I don't speak compass, but it, I'm a grown man, so it's a little bit embarrassing. So he says, you go east. And finally, I worked up a nerve, and I said, which way is that? And I wanted him just to say left or right, but instead, he acts like I'm stupid. He's a stranger, you know, and he goes, east, the direction where the sun comes up. I didn't know the guy, and I said, I never been in your town when the sun came up. <laughs> I drove off. I went down, I turned right. I knew I sh it should be like five miles down the road. I turned right, and I mean, I drove. I didn't see the church. I kept driving. I didn't see the church. I kept driving. I didn't see the church. And I began to think, oh, Lord, is this the right direction? Have I gone the right way? And I drive, and I still don't see the church. And I, it's getting later and later, so I start getting in a panic. Have I gone west instead of east? Have I gone the wrong direction? And so I do what any sensible man does. I drove faster. <laughs> And finally, I got far enough down the road. I hadn't been watching my, my odometer to tell how many miles I'd gone, but I know surely I've gone more than five miles. Finally, I get far enough down the road, and I realize this is the wrong way. And sure enough, I, I, it was. I was going west instead of east. Now, here's the point. It didn't matter how sincere I was, how hard I tried, or how fast I drove. I was never going to get there going the wrong direction. And I'm going to tell you we can achieve righteousness by reading our Bible till, you know, till our eyes are bleeding from reading so long and from praying until we've got calluses on our knees and from evangelizing other people until we're hoarse and can't speak. But I'm telling you, we're never going to achieve righteousness by what we do. We can only know it's been received in Jesus Christ. Yes. But when, we, when Eve ate from that tree, she was trying to do something to become more godly. But you don't have to do that. Well, when she ate from the tree, then it goes on down in verses uh, 6 and following, the end of verse 6. She gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to try to make covering for themselves. The first thing that happened after they ate from that is they became self-conscious. That is the essence of legalistic religion. Legalistic religion will make you so self-conscious. I'm going to say it this way. I'll, I'll, I'll say it to make my point like this. Adam and Eve, if I can say it this way, had been naked all along and that didn't bother them, certainly didn't bother God. But now they notice they're naked in this story. Why do you suppose they notice now? Well, maybe, maybe just maybe, for the sake of argument, let's say that maybe when you're living with face to face with God, you don't ever want to take your eyes off Him to look at yourself when you understand the union you're in. But now because of the, del the delusion, the delusion, the delusion of, of separation, now they felt isolated and alone. Now they take their eyes off God, metaphorically speaking, and they look at themselves and they conclude, look at us. We're not presentable like we are. We're naked. We're not acceptable. We're not presentable to God. Well, again, to go with the flow of the way I'm telling the story, God had seen them from the minute He created them. They'd been naked all along. They were just fine. Listen, I'm going to talk Georgia talk to you now. You ready? God's seen you butt naked and you're all right. It's all right. God knows everything about you. It's all good. But once you fall into the trap and snare of legalism, you start thinking there's something wrong with me and I'll, now I need to do something. Remember, Eva tried to become more like God, but it backfired. It always does. And now instead of feeling more like God, she felt less like God. Nothing had changed in her at all or in God. It, 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 ontologically, she was the same. It had all changed in her mind. And so now they make themselves coverings of fig leaves. And you might say this was the first act of religion, something people do with the work of their own hands to try to make themselves acceptable to God because they don't know that they already are acceptable. And so they try to change their behavior and make themselves look more presentable. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do that because God does not reject or accept people on the basis of behavior. That doesn't mean behavior doesn't matter. I like what, I think maybe Brad said it. Uh, I like what, I think it was Brad said it, maybe Brian, who I, I don't remember, said, uh, you know, a lot of folks say, well, you know, some people in grace think commandments is a bad word. No, 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 no. No. Behavior is important. 
behavior matters. I'll say it, behavior matters. But you know what? When you understand your union with God through the Son and the Spirit, when you understand that union, behavior is the natural outflow. It's the river of living water that flows out of your innermost being. Sure, there are New Testament commandments that can be seen through the lens of, of, of grace and love. And, 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 and by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we say, how, how can I live a lifestyle that honors Him? And then we see these things in the Bible and we say, yes, yes. Uh, or to put it this way, we know that we love Him if we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. They're not a burden. My wife, Melanie, if you met her, you'd like her. Melanie's a wonderful woman. People where I go say, I feel like I know your wife because you talk about her so much. I talk about her a lot because she's a wonderful woman. Uh, she's, she's a beautiful woman in every way. Uh, some of you know my story. I married Melanie. She's the only girl. I married her when she was 18. I was 19. We'll have our 42nd wedding anniversary this next, in July next month. Uh, she's the only girl I ever went out on a date with. I never even dated any. I've never been on a date with anybody except the one I married. Sweet deal. If you saw her, you'd know why. She was on the homecoming court. I was a dweeb. She was charming. I was a doofus. She was wonderful in every way. I just fell head over heels in love with her. So, I've been married all these years. So, what's behavior wise, if I were to say to you, now, after 42 years of marriage, uh, when I go home and see my wife after being gone this week, when I see my wife, do I have to kiss her? What's the rule on that? What's the marriage rule? What's the appropriate thing? Do I have to kiss her? I don't have to kiss her. I do have to kiss her. We don't, how about that? It's like, is it okay to drink wine? Is it okay to go to an R movie? Is it okay to, you know, you get all kind of answers when you put those things out there. May I propose to you that the question itself is a ridiculous question? Yeah. Because I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't need your freaking rules about whether or not I kiss my wife when I get home. <laughs> I don't need your rules on that. You know why? Because when I get home, my motivation won't be based on a rule. It'll be flow from out of a relationship. Right. It won't be a law, it'll be love. Yeah. If I were to say, oh, oh, I do need to kiss her, okay. I do need to kiss her, then the next question I'm gonna say is what kind of kiss? Mm -hmm. After 42 years, can it just be, Mwah. can it be that? <laughs> or does it need to be one of those movie kisses? <laughs> you know, what? You, you see, you carry that out to the absurd. The truth is I'm not governed in my relationship to my wife by those kinds of rules. I am governed by an intrinsic desire. And this is what grace does. Nobody's saying behavior doesn't matter. In fact, let me say this. These people, I see it. I see it on the internet. Somebody just this week wrote me. And in fact, a friend I respect a lot, he, I put something on the internet about how that grace does not need to be balanced with anything. And a friend that I respect wrote me and said, yes, it does. Because don't you see all the foolishness going on under the name of grace and people doing this and doing that and doing that and they're saying, I'm under grace. It needs to be balanced. And I wrote back and said, no, it does not. I said, what you are describing is not grace, it's disgrace. There is a such thing as disgrace. For God's sake, don't act like a fool and then call it grace. Grace is the divine enablement by the life of Jesus in us. For us to be all that he called us to be. Didn't mean to spit on you, Paul. And do all that he called us to do. You feel more anointed? I do. Okay. Rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. If, you, if I come in and you're sitting back there next time, I'll understand. Grace is divine enablement. I'm going to say it like this. Anything you can with integrity ask Jesus to do through you, help yourself. Just go do it. I didn't make this stuff up. I mean, even Augustine said, love God and do as you please, right? Uh, you know, Luther was teaching it, and somebody said, a student said, are you saying I can do anything I want to do? And Martin Luther paused and said yes. And then he looked at the student and said, now, what do you want to do? The truth is, some of us have never been free to live a godly lifestyle. We've always been obligated to. And so now, if we under freedom doesn't mean you can pull down your pants and run down the street. You're free to do that if you want to act like an idiot. But don't call it grace. That's disgrace. Grace, Paul said to Titus, if you've if you got a problem with this whole concept that grace empowers us to live a godly lifestyle, then, then what about what Paul said to Titus when he told him in chapter 2 verse 12 that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now, grace does not give birth to moralism, but neither does it give rise to immoral living. To interact with grace is to interact with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, 
And even the Bible talks about the grace of God in the genitive sense, the possessive sense. It's the grace of God. I love that, the uncreated force. It is the nature of God. Let me tell you the wonderful thing about this grace is that grace is the oxygen in the environment in which we live with Him. I dare you to understand that and act like a fool. Moral or immoral living, moral or immoral living, not one or the other, both, moral or immoral living, becomes a foul stench in the fragrant environment of His presence. And we always are in His presence. We live in union. And that union that we live in is based on the reality of what... uh, 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 that, is based, that is the basis of the reality from which we are to live our lives. We live out of our union with God through the Son and the Spirit. We don't live our lives on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil asking, would it be right or wrong? Should I this or should I that? Let me tell you, what grace does is it moves us from the ought to column and puts it under the want to column. Yeah. It changes it from obligation and lets us see it's an opportunity. It delivers us from rules and we get enraptured by relationship. It causes us to abandon laws and to embrace love. It causes us to come to the place where we can quit focusing on behavior at all and we can simply rest in Him and let the Spirit of Jesus who lives in us and lives His life through us just be who He is in us and through us. And when we do that, we are indeed living a life of authentic grace and it is an effortless life. Not a life of passivity, not a life where we don't trust. I don't mean that. But it is a life free from struggle. It is a life that Jesus promised when He said, Come to me, all ye that labor. I'll quote the version I grew up on that I memorized. And are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Religion will wear you down, but the life of Jesus will lift you up and allow you to float on the effortless wings of His love as you navigate through your days, trusting the river of living water to just flow forth from your innermost being so that everything and everybody around you gets soaking wet with nothing less than Him. That's right. Amen? That's right. Amen.